Good evening. I am really glad to be with you guys. To, uh, to start off our week and end our week is, uh, is honestly a true privilege. Uh, I'm a, a big fan of full disclosure and speaking very, very directly, very, very upfront. And I hate it when people try to trick me or, or, or just don't like, like, just say what you got to say. You know what I mean? Like, I don't like how people mince words. So let me just tell you where this is going tonight because I don't want anyone in this room feeling like they got tricked. I don't want anyone in this room feeling like, well, I didn't understand that's what that was, okay? So let me just tell you right now how this message is going to end. So there's no ambiguity. I'm giving you the invitation right here, right now, right up front. I'm not waiting until the end, okay? At the end of this message, I plan to call probably about at least to my mind, I don't know what the Lord's going to do, but quite a few of you guys in this room uh, to absolutely surrender your lives, both your, as Mark said, your avocation and your vocation. I'm going to call and ask if the Lord would, would move in you, that you would give your lives to vocational ministry. All of your days, all of your work life, everything to that. Any confusion about where I'm heading tonight? Okay, I don't think that call is for everyone in this room. I do not. Um, I think that God's going to work on some of you in very specific ways. And I want you to understand, man, um, at CIY, we have pushed all week long and everywhere we go, we highlight this beauty of, of the way you can do kingdom work whether that's with horses or foster kids or whether that's in the workplace. There's all kinds of ways to do kingdom work. And, and I know that you guys spend your entire life, people telling you you can be doctors and lawyers and people telling you you can be coaches and all of those things are of the Father, okay? They are. But rarely does somebody stand on a stage and look you right in the eye and say, some of you in this room need to pursue ministry completely with your life for all of your days until you die. And that's what I'm about to do. Okay? Any confusion on that? We get it? We good? I know it's not for everyone, but for some of you, that's what it's for. So this, this is for you. So I'm going to ask you, we're just going to take a moment of silence, and then i got to get to work. Uh, and let's just pray for the people around you, maybe the people in front of you, the people behind you, the people next to you. Just ask for, the, for God's wisdom to be on them, and maybe even for your own heart to be open to this call. Uh, I have no desire to trick anyone. This is where this will land, is me calling students to the front of the stage to pledge their life to full-time ministry. Anybody, any confused on where this is heading? We all get it? Okay, moment of silence. I'm just going to ask you to pray for the people around you. So, Jesus, I don't always understand the way you work. God, I pray that you can sift through the emotion of, of this sermon, sift through uh, everything in my heart, and Lord, may you, Holy Spirit, convey uh, what you're compelling people to do, what you are asking them to do, and God, may they sense uh, by the movement of the Holy Spirit within them that this is a call from your throne room. Uh, God, I, I pray that you would raise up a remnant of young men and women who would surrender their lives all of their days to making sure your gospel is proclaimed, uh, to making sure that your church is served, to make sure that, uh, that people caught in bondage are being delivered into freedom. And God, I pray that you'd raise up a remnant of young men and women in this room who would give all of their days toward that cause. I ask this in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as you know, we've been living in the book, uh, we, Elijah's life. Tonight and this morning, Mark jumped us off into 2 Kings. If you get your Bibles, we're going to jump in there. I'm actually going to read what Mark read. We're going to pick up, and I kind of want to tag team a little bit with Mark. So in 2 Kings chapter 2 is where we're going to pick up. And I'm going to go ahead because I love the story, and you've heard it once today. I want you to hear it again. I, I think it's going to be complimentary, but let's get to work. Here we go, 2 Kings chapter 2. We'll have it on the screen as well. Let's go. It says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah, um, oh, sorry, uh, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up into heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. And so they went down to Bethel. And the company of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, do you know that your master is going to be taken for you today? Yeah, I know, Elisha said, but do not speak of it. And Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, well, surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. And so they went to Jericho. The company of prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, I said, you, you know that the Lord 
Uh, let's switch my thing. Uh, went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, replied. Do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. He replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak and he rolled it up and he struck the water with it. And the water divided to the right and the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? He said, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked, you've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it'll be yours, otherwise not. And as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he went back and he stood at the bank of the Jordan. And then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord God of Elijah? He asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. I don't know. In my mind, it's it's this whole view of a mentor passing on, you know, something to you know, uh, you know, an apprentice. It's this beautiful moment where you know you're watching, you know, the retiring quarterback, you know, handing the the playbook off to the other quarterback. And I was trying to figure out what this would look like in my generation versus your generation. This is the best that I could come up with. My generation would have looked at Mean Joe Green in the in the Coke commercial. Anybody remember that? Adults, remember that when it's like you know, you know, thanks kid. He throws a jacket to him. He throws the jersey to him. Your generation, yeah, whatever, man. I couldn't show the one where he throws his shirt because I would have lost half the crowd for the rest of the message. But this is a crazy moment where he hands this mantle, this cloak of leadership. He leaves it behind for Elisha. And I'm going to walk through that because this is a whole, whole series of last. This is Elijah's last lap. Have you ever gone back to a place that's meaningful? I mean, I think for me, the other day I was, I took my son to go meet a friend on the way back. I realized I was kind of in the neighborhood where I lived as a little bitty kid after my parents had gotten divorced. And I went back to my grandpa's farm and I was completely by myself and I was looking at the old farm that grandpa used to own. I remember going with him to milk cows and hauling hay and, I mean, the tears. I remember riding on the tractor with him and I could just smell, I could smell the aromas and remember his voice. And man, I felt the tears start to well up as I'm sitting alone in my car. And I wonder, man, I wonder if I would have known that it was my last time to talk to him before I heard the phone call in eighth grade that he was dead. Like, I wonder, I wonder what it would have been like. Like, I think of my daughter, Sydney. There's a last time when I held her. Like, I don't know when it was. I don't know where we were. But there's a moment when she put her hands up to me. And the day before, I picked her up and I carried her. And for some reason, the next day that I didn't. And I wish I understood how important that last time to hold my daughter was. I mean, now she's 15. It'd be kind of creepy. But... I wish, I wish I kind of held on to that last time. I wish I held on to the last conversation with my grandpa. It's her last walk. It's her last talk. It's her last time together. Man, a deep bond has developed between these guys. As Mark said, they've been together for 18 years. Elisha, he's got permission from Elijah to stay behind, but he won't. I think Elijah was testing his commitment, and Elisha was all in. Elisha's been a great friend to Elijah, the kind of friend that we all want, the kind of person that sticks beside you through thick and thin. I think the question for us, just like it is for Elisha, is will we persevere? And will we persist? Elisha's been the true disciple. He's given up everything to follow a prophet. And trust me, 12 guys in a few years or a, a long time later will do the same thing with Jesus. Luke 16 has this beautiful thing about, man, if you're faithful with little, you'll be entrusted with much. And for 18 years, Elisha has been faithful with little things, and now he's about to be entrusted with much. It's the last time. It's the last time. 18 years of being together, and this, this is it. So they kind of go on this city tour. And I wonder why Elijah chooses the cities that he chooses. It's really kind of interesting to me. And, and I'm going to unpack a little bit about why he goes on this journey. Because I think there's a reason why they're listed in the Bible. 
you know, first of all, a couple of these places, they are, they're centers for pagan worship, man. A couple of these cities, man, there are some bad things going down in those towns. And I think Elisha is just ready for one more fight, if you notice that anybody wants to get along. I think he shows up in a couple of these towns that are, are centers for evil, and he's like, I'm here, anybody want some? And kinda, everybody kind of stands down as Elijah, as Elijah moves through, Elisha following him. There's also some schools of prophets in those towns, and I love the fact that, that God establishes centers of evil, in the, uh, centers of worship in the, in the center of evil. The first place he goes to is Gilgal. Remember the name of that town, Gilgal? That's, it's a really unique town. Mark talked about it a little bit at the adult leaders meeting, but I'm going to kind of unpack it with you guys as students. There, there's two different towns called Gilgal, and it doesn't matter which one you want to pick. Both of them are a place of beginning for the Israelites. One of those is when they cross over into this land they're going to get, Gilgal is the first place they camp. It's most likely the other one. And that's where they completely consecrate themselves before God and say, we are all yours. It's their place of absolute beginning. Where's your beginning? Mine's in a little classroom. Mark Twain Elementary. Mine's also in a little house where I heard my first prayer when I spent the night with Curtis and I'd never seen people pray before. My other beginning is when I stand in my house to this day and I look out over the river behind my home and I can see later on, I can almost look out of my imagination, I can see the very river where I was baptized and my mom were baptized on the same day. And then I can see Justin and Levi are baptized, Sydney's been baptized, and someday Silas. Those are my Gilgal, man. They're my place of beginning. It's where I consecrated my heart to the Lord. Where's your beginning? Where's your Gilgal? You're going to want to remember it because for some of you guys that are going to be going on this journey into ministry, you need to remember your Gilgal. You need to know the place where you consecrated yourself before God, where you set yourself apart for his service. The next place he goes to is Bethel. It's, it's the house of God. Abraham was there long before Elijah was. Abraham is like, it's this place where Abraham first met God and he builds this altar. And anytime Abraham's in the midst of struggle, this is where he will go to pray. And this is where he went in times of searching. And not only him, but lots of people will follow behind him and after him. I kind of picture Elijah walking into this town now seeing the very pillars and stones established by his ancestors, the people who went before him, these stones of remembrance that marked the times of struggle, that marked the times when he went through opposition, but he met God in those places and God sustained him. We all need to know our Bethel, our places where God meets us, our places where he spends time with us, like, like Cherith. I think when he walked into Bethel, he remembered, that's where, that's where I met God was at Cherith, where God sustained me. I think he remembers Zarephath. When he lived with this widow, and he probably got close to her son, you know, probably loved and liked this kid, hung out with him, and all of a sudden he drops dead. And he remembers Zarephath, because that's a place where God surprised him. I think he remembers Mount Carmel, because on that day on Mount Carmel, when he's dropping water on the altar, praying to God that he shows up, on that day God sustains him in battle. I think he remembers the cave when he struggled with mental illness, because on that day God spoke to him. Never forget your Bethel. Always know where you began, but also know and remember those important times where you found yourself in a place of prayer and God showed up. What are your special places spiritually? For me, I've got stones of remembrance, literally altars of remembrance that I've built in Washington over a time of need. I've built some in New Mexico with my boys over a time of need. I built stones of remembrance on the side of Table Rock Lake over a very special time. I built stones of remembrance with my kids in Alaska places that are special to us have those places Elijah's just not on some little walk he's on a journey a journey he wants to remember it's a place where Jacob went when he was afraid and this is a place where you need to run to when it gets hard and as you guys some of you guys in this room pursue ministry you better know your Bethel because it will get hard it will get difficult and you're going to need a place to run to your place of prayer. One of my favorite places for me is in a deer stand or sitting beside a river behind my home. And often I run to those places to meet God when I'm having trouble. You're going to need it. Trust me. But he doesn't just stay in Bethel. He moves on to Jericho. And Jericho is a place of battle for us. We would almost see that as a Normandy, man. Jericho is a place where God shows up in warfare and he delivers this land to the people. I wonder if Elijah's imagination can pick up what's going on. Can he look around at now that these walls are all down on the ground? Does he remember the battle that went before him? Can he in his mind's eye hear the trumpets blaring that Joshua said to blow? Can all of a sudden, can he hear the rumble of the walls fall? Can he hear the swish of the arrows? Can he hear the cries of the enemy? 
And I wonder in that moment if he remembers his own battles. As he walks through Jericho and he sees a place that was warfare, does he remember his own battles in that moment? Does he remember the battle that he fought on Mount Carmel against the forces of Baal, the forces of evil? Does he remember the numerous battles that he had with, you know, stupid Ahab and wicked Jezebel? Does he remember those battles? Does he remember the battle that he had under the juniper tree and in the cave when he battled mental illness and depression and he wanted to give up? I don't know. But I think of this journey when he shows up in Jericho, he remembers, and you're going to need to remember too, the places where you went to war and God showed up and he delivered you. Not just where it all started, not where just God met you when you were struggling, but remember the times when it was hard and God showed up and he delivered you in miraculous ways. You're going to remember your Jerichos. Make a list of them and never forget them because this journey will get hard and you're going to need to remember those places. Mark them down. Write them down. For the next 40, 50, 60 years, never forget those days. And then Jordan, where we find ourselves right now. I don't know, man. The Jordans were when the Israelites first crossed over. Joshua sends them down into the water. Moses is dead. They go down to the water. They cross over and they tell them to, to pick up these stones and set them on the other side. And they said, put these stones up in a pile so that everybody remembers what God did in this space. And I don't know where Elijah passed, but in my mind's eye, I like to pretend it's there. That he looks and he sees the Jordan River, where it all started. Remember, 1 Kings 17, he crosses the Jordan River. And God says, cross the Jordan and go over there. And now in 2 Kings 2, he says, cross the Jordan this way. I'm taking you somewhere else. Cross of the Jordan, having completed his mission. It reminds me of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. He says, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. He's finished his leg of the race. Elijah knew it was over. Understand, Elijah knows this is his last day on earth. Elisha knows this is his last day on earth. All the prophets know this is his last day on earth. If you knew it was your last day on earth, what's going through your mind? I love the posture that you see in Elijah when he knows it's his last day on earth. He's moving quickly, moving through the memories, moving through a spirit of thankfulness. He approaches that Jordan, and he is dead set on where he's going, and he reminds me a lot of Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, verse 32, it says they were on their way up to Jerusalem. Now mark these words, they're on their way to Jerusalem. And if you look at the bottom, it says they'll condemn him to death, they'll mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him, and three days later he will rise. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And look up there at the very top, with Jesus leading the way. Just like Elijah, Jesus is a pioneer. He's heading in, even though he knows it's going to be at the end of his life, he doesn't lean away. He leans into this adversity. He leans into the fear. He leans into the difficulty. He reminds me a lot of Paul when Paul says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And then he's gone. gone remember uh i went <laughs> went one time on a trip to san diego amazing trip i was there on a youth ministry conference hanging out and uh, i didn't have anything to do that night and so i don't remember who i went with or how i got there but we went over to coronado island which is just off of of, uh, of san diego it's where all the navy seals do their training and i remember finding myself that night on coronado island and and i was just alone it was dark nighttime i'm looking out Across the way, I can see, you know, downtown San Diego, and it's really pretty. It's all lit up. And, uh, and I'm just sitting on this little beach, this small little beach on Coronado Island, completely alone. And I remember looking, and, and these waves just kind of kept lapping in, and I, and I had this realization. I realized that wave just hit the sand, and I'm the only person in the entire world that saw that. I'm kind of weird like that. I looked, I was like, nobody else saw that but me. That's amazing. And I watched wave after wave come in, and I'm like, I'm the only one that saw that. There's not another human being that will ever see what I just saw. And I'm just blown away by that. And I keep watching them come in. And then all of a sudden, I get this realization. Like this wave, I don't know for how far, it's followed the motion that the Creator put into it. And its only objective is to come ashore at Coronado Island to beat that sand and to die. 
Like some waves, they get caught in a photograph, and, and people remember them when they, when they show them on their screens of their vacation. Some, some waves, they get caught, you know, in, in some little postcard that, that people are going to mail around. You can see a wave in the background, but not these waves. They will faithfully follow the motion of their Creator, and they'll beat the shore and die if nobody else ever sees them. And I think that's Elijah's life, and I think that should be our life. Can we be content to just beat the shore and die if no one ever knows who we are? quote by a guy named Nicholas Zinzendorf he says preach the gospel die and be forgotten I want that to be the motto of my life in my office I have my coffin that I'll be buried in and I look at it every day when I go to work because I want to live a life that will beat the shore and die That if nobody ever knew who I was, that every day my life would be marked with faithfulness. And the only thing that I want to hear is not the applause of men. I want to hear Jesus look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's what I live for. And what you need to realize is Elijah and Elisha had no idea they'd ever be written down in a book. They didn't know we'd do a conference about them someday. These men were faithful with the motion that God had put inside of them. They had no idea we'd write books about them. We'd tell stories about them. They thought they'd be like anybody else and just go down in the annals of history. They'd preach the gospel, they'd die, and they'd be forgotten. And God sends a chariot and a whirlwind to get him. In my mind, God sends a chariot because it's a warrior's welcome home. He doesn't go up in the chariot, he goes up in a whirlwind, and I, I think it's almost like this kind of glory. It's so powerful, it literally separates them, and it takes them. And Elisha know that he's got to watch. That from dirt to earthly earthly glory, he's challenged to keep his eyes on heaven. Even if his his feet want to slip and his spirit wants to fade, he cannot run, he cannot look away. And I think about what what we're told by the author of Hebrews in chapter 12. That we should hold that same attitude that therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, much like Elisha fixed his eyes on Elijah. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition so that you, will not grow weary in doing good will we count the cost will we endure and will we seek the glory of God above our own this cloak is left behind you see something there this cloak will be important the first thing that you'll watch is a brokenness within Elijah Elisha I, I don't know how the cloak ends up there I don't know if it's one of those things where Elijah's kind of Elijah kind of tosses it down. I don't think he does. I don't think he just falls off. I think God Himself, God Himself lets this thing fall to the ground. Right? At Elisha's feet. And it's almost that same attitude. Like, you don't have to do this. It's like Elijah telling him over and over, stay here. You don't have to do this. And in that moment, God's like, You want that? You want that. Puts it right on the ground in front of him. Do you want that, Elisha? And what does he do? He does the same thing he did the first time he got the cloak. He tears up what's old. First time we see him, he tears apart, you know, the oxen, the yokes. He gets rid of everything. And in this moment, he takes his old cloak, and he literally, the Hebrew says, he tears it apart into pieces. In other words, he's not planning on putting the old one on again. He's going to have to put this one on. And when he puts this one on, he's not putting on a garment. He's putting on a goal. When he puts this one on, he's putting on the mission of God. And this is a complete shift in his identity. He's going from assistant to lead. The mission's now on his back. And make no mistake, this is way more than a garment. I remember when I had that moment and my identity changed, just like Elisha's, or similar to. (laughs) First time I was a graduated senior. Actually, it's probably before this, probably my sophomore year. We called it summer conference back then. You guys call it move. But I remember a preacher preaching, and all of a sudden I got rocked. 
and then it happened again to me in 1987 my graduate after I just graduated high school and all of a sudden a guy gets up and he preaches and my heart gets rocked thinking man I don't want to be in ministry I want to go to law school I want to be a constitutional attorney I want to run for senate I don't want to do this I don't want to be in ministry it's not what I want to do and people would say things like well you know what if you feel like you could do anything else but preach the gospel do it hey man there's a lot of things I could do besides preach the gospel it's Christ's love that compels me to do this there's a million other jobs that I could do this is the one I choose I choose to do this because of Christ's love he confirmed it again when I was at school down at Ozark in 1989 and again when I had my first ministry when I was 19 years old he confirmed it again and I think the scripture that moves me and I hope also will move some of you is this text from 2nd Corinthians for Christ love compels us because we were convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again and that moment was my call to ministry I realized when I read that text Christ's love compels me I cannot believe what he's rescued me from and, when, and now I see what he's rescued me for because I go to the ne next part and I said therefore we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us and I realized my days need to be lived that way his love compelled me he's changed me he's transformed me he set me free from bondage and all I want to do with my life is do the same thing for others his love compels me Elijah put his cloak on Elisha and Jesus has put his cloak on us for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ Elijah left his mission to be continued in Elisha and Jesus has left his mission to be continued in you it's grim determination not fatalistic defeat that causes him to pick this thing up it's not like he's got a death wish no the mission is too important it's not like he just like oh I'm gonna pick this up he knows he's got a target on his back he knows that everyone in Israel is gonna want to kill him just like his boss he may be popular but nobody likes him they all want to kill him Elisha when he picks up this cloak he realizes I'm picking up a hard life right now he's walked with this guy for 18 years and he knows what's ahead with grim determination not fatalist defeat that he will put this cloak on his back and he is a marked man you are one decision away from a totally different and amazing life one decision away from a totally different and amazing life what was Elisha's one decision he picked it up and he raised it up that's what changed everything and keep in mind this Hebrew word for pick it up is probably not what you think it is it's not like you just kind of reached down and did this it's not like there's something on the ground and so he picked it up no 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 no. what the Hebrew means is he didn't just pick it up he literally raised it up he didn't just do this he lifted it up before a holy God he lifted it up in fact the word that he uses there throughout the scripture it's used all over the Psalms and it means to like to extol like one of those is in Psalm 34 verse 3 you can see it up here let us exalt same word you can also see in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord high and exalted what he does with this garment what he does with his cloak is he takes something incredibly ordinary it could have been a souvenir it could have been a keepsake it could have been something like oh I want to remember my friend Elijah but he doesn't do that he takes something incredibly ordinary and he lifts it up before an extraordinary God and that posture makes all the difference posture changes everything without the posture when he walks up the Jordan he rolls it up and smacks the water without lifting it up first before the God without submitting it before a holy father without looking at God and saying I'm yours this is yours whatever you want to do he didn't just pick it up he picks his whole life up in that moment and says I want to take your mission I want to accept the mission of advancing and delivering people from bondage I want to accept that mission today I want to accept the mission of giving the people freedom if he doesn't take that posture man he's just doing laundry in the Jordan He's not part in water. If he didn't take that posture, he's swimming the Jordan. He's not walking across on dry ground. It is our posture with ordinary things before an extraordinary God that makes all the difference. So what does God put at your feet? What does God put at your feet? I like what 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 reminds us. Don't neglect or ignore or overlook what you've got. The power is not in the object 
The power is not in the ability. The power is in the posture. Some examples of that. Abraham. Some of you guys won't know this illustration. You can ask your youth leaders about it later, but I'm going to move through it quickly. Man, it is, it is one thing to pick up a knife. Lots of people picked up knives. It's one thing for Abraham to pick up a knife. It's a whole other game when you raise a knife. It's one thing for Moses to pick up a staff. It's a whole other thing to raise up a staff in the presence of the strongest military leader, the strongest political leader in the whole known world. It's one thing to pick up a staff. It's a whole other thing to raise it up. Every single soldier in Israel, when the giant came out and he taunted them every day, every one of them picked up a sword every morning and walked out to their foxholes and hid. But only David was willing to raise it up. And if you want to experience deliverance for the broken, if you want to experience freedom, if you want to experience victory, then take the ordinary things that God gives in your hands and lift them up before Holy Father. Jesus. Jesus picked up a cross and raised his own life up knowing what God could do. And God will raise him from the dead. And everything will change for us. See, when you look at this, the danger's worth it for Elisha. Elijah's name means, my God is Yahweh. Remember I told you that first night, it's like saying, you know, my name is Jesus Christ is Lord. Elijah's name is, my God is Yahweh. Elisha's name means God is salvation. And in that, you have everything you need to know to rescue people from bondage. Everything you know to rescue people from slavery. Who God is and what he can do is wrapped up in these two names of Elijah and Elisha. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. And God brings salvation. Those two names encapsulate all you need to know to start moving forward. Who God is and what he can do. It's different today than it was 100 years ago. We've gotten weak as believers, and we've turned soft. hundred years ago, do you know what 18, 19, and 20-year-olds were doing? hundred years ago, they were packing their belongings in coffins, and they weren't getting on planes or getting on ships, and they were setting sail for some of the remote areas of the known world or unknown world at that point in time. They packed their belongings in coffins because they never expected to return. And why did they put their belongings in coffins? Because they were missionaries and they realized there was a world of people who needed the gospel. So they would pack their belongings in coffins, never expecting to come home, expecting to live every ounce of their life. They didn't have FaceTime. There were no flights home. It all went in the coffin because they figured that's the only way their body was coming back. One of those guys was A.W. Milne. He went to the South Pacific where missionary after missionary had been killed by a tribe. And he was next man up. He showed up, and for 35 years he preached to this tribe, and they didn't kill him. In fact, at the end of his time, <laughs> they buried him in the middle of the center, in the center of the village. And this is what they, what they wrote as his epitaph. When he came, there was no light and when he left, there was no darkness. Where are they now? Where are the young men and the young women who will risk it all for the gospel? Where are they now? Are we all just going to play it safe? Are we all just going to try to live these lives of shelter? Are we all trying to try to live these lives where, where we don't have to experience any fears? You've got a generation around you that's trying to protect you. And I'm telling you, you are not weak. You've got a generation of adults that are trying to tell you that's too risky. Yet you are risk takers. And we need a new generation like we had 100 years ago. We need a new generation of believers who don't need to play it safe, who aren't afraid of opposition, who can stand in the face of adversity and will keep going until they bring you back in a coffin. Preach, die, and be forgotten. Elisha will push to the very end. But he will not go out like Elijah. It won't happen. <laughs> In fact, he will die a slow, painful death that gets revealed in 2 Kings chapter 13, but something's fascinating about that. At the very end of his life, they say almost the same thing that they say about Elisha. He says, look, the chariots and the horsemen of the Lord come to welcome him home as well. Their death 
may be different, but their destiny is the same. Elijah is gone, but his kingdom work remains. And when a man or woman of God dies or moves on, nothing of God ever dies. God always has a backup plan. Exit Moses, enter Joshua. Exit Elijah, enter Elisha. Exit Stephen, enter Paul. Exit Paul, enter Timothy. Exit Jesus, into the Holy Spirit. We have been equipped for this. We are the next man up. We are the next woman up. Guys, at some point, guys like me are going to joyfully accept our welcome home. I will fight until that day, but I will joyfully accept being poured out like a drink offering until the day they put me six foot under and everyone eats chicken and potato salad. Until that day, I will fight. What about you? I'm inviting you to adventure. I'm not calling you to some fatalistic life. I'm calling you to a determination. That the mission matters so much that you will lean into adversity, even if it gets difficult, because God's method has always been to use men and women of God to advance his kingdom. He's always used people to deliver from bondage. But if we can't raise up the next generation, who's going to take my place? Who's going to take the place of the leaders, you know, right now in your church, of the missionaries on the field? If everyone's going to be weak, tired, and timid, and no one's willing to step up, who's willing to lean into this life and adventure? It will not be easy, but it will be incredibly rewarding. Soon, as Elijah ascended, Elisha got to work. And in fact, he, he goes on kind of the same journey. He goes back to Jericho, back to Bethel. I think he's going to pick a fight with some of those pagan towns. He goes back to Gilgal. He goes back to Mount Carmel like, anybody here? Anybody want some? I love the fact that he just goes right back through it and says, I'm going to get on it. It reminds me what happens with the disciples in Mark 16. It says, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was taken to the heaven. He sat down at the right hand of God, and then, then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. The same Holy Spirit that filled them is the same Holy Spirit that fills you, and we need people who will preach everywhere. Andy Minio says it best, you can't stop us. You can't stop me. You cannot. Because for every one of us, they kill. For every one of us, they stop. It's always next man up. And the same thing's true for Elisha. Because I can look at Elisha when he's on his deathbed and say, Elisha, we're good. You're going to be okay. Because Amos and Jonah are on deck. Elisha, you're all right. Because in the other half of the kingdom, we get Obadiah, we get Joel and Isaiah ready to step up. It's always next man up. It's always next woman up. And my question is, who in this room is that next man? Who in this room is God calling to be that next woman? To give all of your days to no other vocation but pursuing and passionately advancing and freeing from bondage. Those who have been captured and enslaved by sin. He will lay down his life with a cloak on his back. He will cross over and joyfully take his place on the line. Not with fatalism and sadness, but with grim determination. And that is my attitude. I don't care how hard it gets, bring it. I, I'm not afraid. I'm all about the mission. I've literally put my identity behind me and put the cross before me, and there is no, no turning back. Like, this is where I'm going. I've been captivated here lately by the biography on Ulysses S. Grant. It's long, but I've loved it. And I was going through it the other day, and a story came up from Cold Harbor, one of the battles. And I think this happened in lots of other battles but there's this moment at Cold Harbor where the Union soldiers realize that the battle in front of them is going to be so difficult that many of them, if not all of them, are going to die. And they understand that what's in front of them will be hard. And so Horace Porter writes this in June of 1884. He says, Many here will remember an instance of desperate courage which ought to become historic. They will remember the soldiers who sat down at night before another desperate charge had been ordered at Cold Harbor. They took pieces of paper, they wrote their, on them they wrote their names, and they pinned the papers to their backs and their coats so that their friends might recognize their dead bodies when found on the fields after battle. This was an instant 
of desperate, devoted, sublime courage. We will continue his mission. We will do that. We will endure. Why would they write their names on their back? It wasn't fatalistic defeat. It was grim determination because those soldiers realized that because what had been done to black people was completely wrong, that no one should be enslaved, everyone should experience freedom, and they're willing to lay down their very lives to see these people experience freedom. And tonight I'm calling people to put your name on your back and your mission before you, to lay down all of your days, every ounce of your life, every ounce of your fiber, all of your money, all of your time, all of your vocation, and say, I will deliver every one of my days to deliver people from bondage. This is not for everyone. Hold on, hold on. This is not for everyone. Please don't think that coming up and getting one of these is a light idea. I would caution you to really weigh out what it means to pick up this cloak, this piece of paper, and write your name on it and pin it on your back. But we need the next man and the next woman up. And just like the boys did at Cold Harbor, I'm asking you to come up here. If you want to accept that call, caution, slow down. You think about this. There may only be one person in the whole room that's going to do this. We're not going for numbers on this. But if God is calling you to surrender your life to ministry, to come grab a piece of paper, write your name on it, walk up to an adult leader and say, put this on my back right here, right now. I'm next man up. I'm next woman up. Anybody want this? Come on. Do not come with fatalism. You come with grim determination. You come knowing that at some point you will face the God of heaven. Do not do it out of emotion. You do it out of determination. You calculate the courage that it will take to finish this task. You calculate the courage it will take to complete this course. You run the race. You finish the race. You start the race. You complete the race. You don't quit. You don't back down. You don't give up. Write your name on there. And I will see each and every one of you on the other side of the Jordan, all right? I'm going to beat most of you there because I'm old. But I don't mind being old. Just means I've had longer to be faithful to this calling than you have, and I'm very proud of that. But I'll see you on the other side of the Jordan, young lady. I will see you on the other side of the Jordan. Don't you quit. Don't give up when it gets hard. Remember your Gilgal. Remember your Bethel. Remember your Jericho. Don't forget, Jordan's coming. When we start, we finish. Where he sends, we go. We will finish this race. Now, later on tonight, I know that some of you guys are going to want to pull the levers for first-time decisions, for rededications, and we want to welcome that. Can you give this group time to clear out before we do that? Because all of these decisions are important. If you're not sure about this, it's okay to turn around and go back. But, man, I welcome fellow fighters. I welcome fellow soldiers because we need the next pastors in our church. We need the next wave of missionaries. We need people willing to pack it in coffins and get to work. I'll see you on the other side of the Jordan.